Hello, I'm Locke Meredith. I'd like to invite you to join me on the next Legal Lines. My guest is Andrew Mural. He is the spokesman for the City of St. George folks, the ones trying to form a new city. He's going to bring us up to speed. They've now given the register of voters the required number of signatures who want to form a new city. In fact, 1,500 more signatures than needed. Next step should be the register confirms the validity of the signatures and the governor calls an election, unless there's a lawsuit filed. Join us on the next Legal Lines with Andrew Murrow. Hello, I'm Locke Meredith. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you for considering our firm for help in handling your legal matter. We know what we're doing. We've been around for a long time. We have over 60 years combined legal experience as lawyers. I've been practicing over 30 years, Sean over 25, and I have paralegals and legal secretaries who've worked for me for over 27 years. We've handled about every kind of case you can handle, and we've been very good at it. The bottom line is, it is our goal to be your protector when necessary, advisor, negotiator, and to successfully conclude the litigation for you in a way that is very favorable. Knowledge is power. And the folks who know what they're doing empower you. They enable you to make the right kind of decisions that best serves you. And that's our number one goal, frankly. Our number one ministry is to serve you. Welcome to Legal Lines. I'm Locke Meredith, and I'm very pleased to have back on the show Andrew Murrell. He is the spokesman for the City of St. George group of folks trying to become a city. Andrew, it's great to see you again. Thanks for having me back. It's interesting. Uh, looks like the ball is in their court, but before we kind of dive into all that stuff, kind of remind the folks, what's, all, what's this all about? Well, the incorporation effort began initially as a drive for better schools. Uh, if you look around, it doesn't take very long to figure out that we are near the dead last in a state that is dead last in education. And in fact, sadly, a lot of other things. That's but, right. Uh, we and have I love Louisiana. I'm just over 50% of our public schools in EVR Parish are D or F rated. Um, we started off in the last incorporation effort, and the parish was ranked in the 50s. What's happened since then? We're now in the 60s. We're 61st in education in the state, again, that's ranked dead last. So education, a huge component. Uh, many of our volunteers and committee members either work in the uh, parish school system or put their kids through it. I remember the first time around, there were two fellas, they wanted to get their kids in the schools and couldn't do it. That's right. So Better Schools started this drive. And then what happens, we're told mm -hmm. repeatedly through legislature, uh, if you want a school district, you have to become a city. In fact, Mayor Broom at the time herself said, uh, you shouldn't even think about a school until you form a city. This is in the legislature. That's correct. <clears throat> and, and we said, okay. And then we started looking at how does government run an EBR parish? And that became almost as horrifying as the school system. Uh, a budget that's doubled since 2003, that's now over $919 million. Oh, you're telling me stuff I don't uh, even know. $81,000, it increases every single day. Say that again? Uh, the city budget increases $81,000 a day. How? A day, because they've got uncontrollable spending, uncontrollable debt. And instead of controlling or curtailing spending, let's just tax some more taxes on there. So we looked at that. Um, JP Morgan, not, I didn't make it up. I didn't just fish it out of the water. JP Morgan says Baton Rouge is the fifth most over leveraged city in America and the fifth most underfunded. And so how that, many cities do we have in America? A lot, uh, but that puts thousands us in a, a wonderful category with cities you may have heard of like Chicago, Detroit, uh, cities not known for good governance. Uh, so that was another alarming thing. Then we looked at the taxes. Our sales tax is at 12 and a half percent. Are we in, uh, amongst the highest in the nation? Top right? three highest sales tax in America. Again, with illustrious cities like Chicago. Then we looked at what are we doing about that? Well, nothing. We're adding to the taxes. Well, I'll tell you this. I remember Katz tax where even if you had businesses or properties within the city limits, but li you lived out of the city limits in the parish, you didn't get to vote on whether or not the tax would go forward to, to That's help That's right. Cats. Uh, we've it's had nuts. 18 tax initiatives on the past 16 ballots, and we've got two more coming. So that'll be 20 tax initiatives on the past 17 ballots, not including the ones that got shot down before it got to the ballot by the Metro Council. That's astonishing. Yeah. And it's not stopping anytime soon, and a lot of that money's not going towards the debt it needs to go to. We've got uncontrolled pension debt. 
You know the library system is the si second highest number of employees that we pay for pensions? They have the library? They have 700 folks? employees in the library system. In East Baton Rouge Parish? In East Baton Rouge Parish only. Uh, they have a higher budget than the other major metropolitan uh, library systems combined in this state. Now, I don't hate the library. It just seems like a priority we need to shift a little bit. Could we use some of that money for roads, for more police protection? Which uh, we badly need. Yeah, there's a million different areas this money could go towards. And what we found out is we just want to maintain the status quo. East Baton Rouge Parish just wants to keep doing the same thing. Big bloated government, massive spending, hiring our friends and giving contracts to our buddies, and maintaining a school system that failure seems to be the norm, not the exception. Not a recipe for a lot of success. No, and that's, that's why you have such a, a fervent movement for St. George. That's why we're dedicated. That's why we have massive amounts of volunteers out every weekend gathering signatures and spreading the message. It's because we're tired of the status quo. We're trying to do something different. Well, and from all the folks that I've spoken to about this, this is not trying to hurt anybody else. In well, fact, whoever wants to participate can. That is right. There's no wall going up around St. George. St. George, one of the biggest misnomers and lies that's been spread is that this is a breakaway. Right. We can't break away. We've You're never, in the parish. We've never been, incorpor uh, never been incorporated. We're the unincorporated part of EBR Parish. We're not asking to go to Ascension or Livingston. We're asking to stay here and become essentially a suburb, just like Central, right. just like Baker, and just like Zachary. Right. Who've already done what the city of St. George folks is trying and, to do. And for all those people that back in the day opposed the city of Central's incorporation, they now, for example, like Brack, will promote the city of Central because guess what? Good schools. Central and Zachary, number one, and I believe number three, best school districts in the state. Right. We can do that too. And they, as I understand it, they do it a heck of a lot more efficiently and economically. Well, and there's the other misnomer and lie that spread is we don't <laughs> spend enough money on education in EBR Parish. We don't have a spending problem. We have an allocation problem. We could be spending that money more wisely. EBR Parish spends as much per student, and if not more so, than any other parish in the state. Three to 5,000 more than our neighbors in Central are currently spending So what per is student. the total per student? Per student, uh, that EBR is roughly over 15,000 per student. It's incredible. It's unbelievable. Where does that money go? What are we doing with it? And it's not producing highly qualified, prepared students so that they can go be whatever God meant for them to be. No, it's maintaining the continuous cycle of, of poor education and poverty. And we're trying to break the status quo. A lot of good reasons to move forward with this. So, so kind of bring us up to, to date. Where are we? Well, uh, as you probably know by now, we submitted our signatures to the Registrar of Voters Office. The next step in the process for us was to give notice, and after that notice lapsed, to provide the necessary signatures, which we did. All right, uh, so, so explain to folks the number of votes and of who okay. and within what areas that y'all had to accumulate. We needed 25% of the registered voters in the proposed incorporated area. That was roughly a number around 56,000, which led to a, a total as of when we filed the signatures, 12,991 signatures were needed for us to get on the ballot. That was a 20, So roughly 13,000. That's correct. Just shy of 13,000. We submitted 14,500. We had till November 27th. We had enough early, so we went ahead and submitted October 5th. All right. And so based on, on that fact, the ball's now in whose court? Uh, at this point, it's in uh, the Registrar of Voters, Steve Rayburn's court. So we submitted our signatures. There was a five-day uh, delay after that, at which time uh, people could one last time add their name to the petition drive or remove their name from the petition now, drive. Now, as I understand it, that is a provision that was not in existence the first time that this, this was attempted. That's right. In fact, a lot of things with the petition effort had an uh, infinite timeline the first time around. We could take time to gather signatures as long as we needed. They could take time as long as they needed to remove signatures. Well, that's inefficient and that doesn't seem to fit the process. So this time it was shortened. We had 270 days to get our signatures. They were given five days to withdraw once they were submitted. And so what were the numbers of, of folks who withdrew? Uh, well, if you're talking about actual people who signed the petition that withdrew, it was six. 
Six people. Six people. And, and as I understand it, 97 or six people? We added 97 during the same time frame, yes. All right, let's continue this on the next segment. This is Life Matter at the Legal Lines. My special guest, Andrew Murrell, with the City of St. George. Be right back. Hello, I'm Locke Meredith. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you for considering our firm for help in handling your legal matter. We know what we're doing. We've been around for a long time. We have over 60 years combined legal experience as lawyers. I've been practicing over 30 years, Sean over 25, and I have paralegals and legal secretaries who've worked for me for over 27 years. We've handled about every kind of case you can handle, and we've been very good at it. The bottom line is, it is our goal to be your protector when necessary, advisor, negotiator, and to successfully conclude the litigation for you in a way that is very favorable. Knowledge is power, and the folks who know what they're doing empower you. They enable you to make the right kind of decisions that best serves you. And that's our number one goal, frankly. Our number one ministry is to serve you. Welcome back to Legal Lines. I'm Locke Meredith. Pleased to have back on the show Andrew Murrell. He is the spokesman for the city of St. George, folks. Let's dive back in. Thank All right. Um, balls in their court. Y'all have now submitted 14-5 uh, in signatures. Uh, you only needed about 13,000. And so now the Register of Voters, Mr. Rayburn, has to verify those signatures are valid, right? That's right. So we submit the signatures. The ad withdrawal period that followed that has lapsed, and so now it's solely in his court to validate and verify the signatures that have been submitted. Now, is he doing it quickly? Uh, you, no, um, he was waiting for the attorney general's opinion he, he'd requested. To right, as I, I read, he, he had, uh, the register had submitted 29 questions to our state attorney general. That's right, he submitted 29 questions, a, a broad range of topics, mostly dealing with the fact, how does he deal with this incorporation effort? Um, Which is did, reasonable. It, it, if it's no ambiguous, problem. yeah. It's a big deal. Um, you know, like I told Steve the other day, somebody's going to be mad at him no matter what. It's a tough, <laughs> it, it's a tough job, and yeah. it's a lot of spotlight in a position. Never, you normally, never think you'd ever have to deal with you know, that. Yeah. You never thought you are going to hear your name a lot, of it, but now all of a sudden he's in the spotlight. He got his response from the Attorney General's office, and it was what we'd expected to hear, that he needs to be reasonable and diligent. But that's it. Verify and validate the signatures. So there's no deadline in the statutes to no. regulate. This. He is allowed. He is allowed an, an, an reasonable period, amount of time. But he's got to be reasonable and he's got to be diligent. Okay. Uh, he's got the information he needs. Uh, now I thought I read something here recently that he was going to try and start dedicating uh, manpower and I guess resources to it. But frankly, it sounded like he wasn't going to do much of anything until after these elections in November and December. Yeah. He's Are you in, getting any word? He's intend, his intention, as he stated it previously, was to begin after December runoffs. Okay. Uh, of course, we... I mean, I understand, I guess, in a way. It's, it's a tough spot to be in. I know in St. George, we've been working on this. You know, the seven months we've been gathering signatures doesn't really tell the whole story about how long this process has gone right. on. We've it's got gone a, on for over five years. Yeah, and we've least. got an overwhelming amount of support, and the people that signed this petition are dedicated and they want to see this to finality, and they don't want this to be a process that drags out over the course of another year, right. two years. So we'd like him to begin as soon as possible. Uh, hopefully he'll get to that. Okay, so how exactly does he go about verifying the, the validity of the signatures? Well, on the petition, there's several pieces of information, name, address, birth date, a witness, the dates each signed it, and, and that would be something he could simply validate by looking at voter registration. Uh, he can look at the dates. He can verify that easily. Now, the signature is the one part that he'll have to do a little extra, but it's still just reasonable due diligence. He uses the previous voter records to, to indicate if the signature is valid. So, for example, my signature has changed dramatically over the last 20 years. Yeah, me too. Um, he would be able to use <clears throat> any of those, any of that polling data, any of those signatures. So, any, any documentation that, that it has some level of uh, Whatever veracity. Gets, Whatever gets you to a reasonableness that you can Makes believe sense. that signature was, was true and valid. At that point, good signature, put it on the way, put it over it on the side. Uh, he can't use third party information. Um, so you couldn't, I couldn't walk into his office tomorrow and go, that's a good one. And the opposite. Or trying to argue it's not good. Exactly right. right. I so, mean, this is basically solely within his, 
his realm of analysis. That's right. His purview is reasonableness. Okay. And based on the information that he's got available to him. And nobody else can attack it, as I understand nope. it. Nope. It should be up to Steve Rayburn uh, and his staff. Okay. So let's say he goes through it, and uh, unfortunately for you guys, uh, there's not the required 25%. What happens? Well, I hate to think of that, uh, but I will. Uh, we have well, y'all about fifteen hundred more than you need, so you wouldn't. What? Well, seventy-six votes too short, too too few last time. Allegedly, um, and we would we would at that point get an additional sixty days that we can add signatures. Now that's a new provision again. That's right? correct. Via statute. A lot of the incorporation statute uh, and, and title has been narrowed down to be a little more specific. Before it was open-ended and a lot vaguer. This allows everyone to know what the rules are and you know where the ball is at all times. So we'd get an additional 60 days to add signatures. Okay, and, and can they at the same time start trying to hustle folks to not you know no. withdraw their signatures? No, there's nothing about withdrawing signatures in that 60 day provision. It's solely to add signatures. Okay, so so you get a second bite at the apple if it was necessary. If we have to. Yes. Okay, and so once he determines that let's say it is greater than 25 percent or 25% or greater of the number of registered voters within your your b proposed boundary of the city of St. George, what happens? Now, well, before I go there, describe to folks the boundary of the city of St. George, because it's not the same boundary, right? No, it's a reduced footprint. You can actually see the map anytime you want to at stgeorgelouisiana.com. Uh, you know, going from the north end would be, or going from where I live, which is S and around Jefferson, it goes all the way to Highland, uh, it goes, it touches central in some spots. And the map's available on the website? Absolutely, and it's not gonna be a perfect square, it's not gonna be a perfect circle, and you'll see some spots cut out where the city annexed commercial property. And my recall was that in fact, this time you folks that chose where it was gonna propose to be, actually excluded the areas where the people didn't support that's the right. city of St. George effort previously, respecting their decisions. We have an amazing staff that's able to sit there and look precinct by precinct at who signed this petition, who didn't. And if we didn't garner enough support in that precinct, it was left out this time. In fact, some of these precincts that didn't support us by either not signing the petition, they told us not to come back to their door, or they withdrew their names, cost us from being able to add other precincts on the other side which would have been more supportive. Which wanted to. Because they weren't contiguous to us. Right. So the intent was shrink the footprint to where the support is. Okay. After we're successful in incorporate, we'll begin looking at annexations at that point. Interesting. I hadn't even thought that. Well, speaking of annexations, I'm, I'm hearing wind of maybe that there's attempts to, to do that again, because as I recall last time, mall and a few other folks, hospital maybe and some other areas. I do, I do hear lots of rumor and innuendo about annexations, but no one actually wants to tell us who those places are. We've heard of two businesses and one rumored subdivision, but no one says where they are. No one says what their names are. Uh, so at this point, it's just conjecture uh, until someone says otherwise. So what effect, if in fact an annexation takes place, will that have on the whole effort? Well, I would first say that I don't believe that annexations in the spirit and intent of the current law as it is. Uh, I believe the intent was to not allow annexation during the petition process which to me would be through the balloting process. However, anyone who wants to annex property into the city of Baton Rouge, be careful what you wish for. And you may wanna to talk to your friends at the mall in LaBerge before you do so, because they're not currently getting services from the city of Baton Rouge. St. George Fire Department and the EBR Sheriff's Department still the only service you're getting. Interesting. So that'd be my concern. Uh, but annexation's not going to affect us. So what does uh, that ultimately mean? Do, do, does it just mean you don't get the money that you would have gotten it. in taxes had they you, stayed? You take a couple of commercial businesses, it's a couple of tax dollars. You take a subdivision, it's a little tax dollars plus a handful of people who may have signed our petition. But in the whole game, it's a minor, minor issue for us. Interesting. All right, as I understand it too, um, uh, another possible issue would be if somebody died or moved away um, what effect, if any, would that have on the counting of the, the numbers? As far as the signatures go, they would still count towards the process okay. because of the, the way the voting structure is, is set up. Obviously, they wouldn't be allowed to vote for the, right. if, if it got to the ballot. Okay, well, let's continue this on the next segment. This is Lock Mayor to Legal Lines. My guest, Andrew Mural, talking about the city of St. George, proposed at this point. Be right back. Hello, I'm Lock Meredith. 
Uh, first of all, I want to thank you for considering our firm for help in handling your legal matter. We know what we're doing. We've been around for a long time. We have over 60 years combined legal experience as lawyers. I've been practicing over 30 years, Sean over 25, and I have paralegals and legal secretaries who've worked for me for over 27 years. We've handled about every kind of case you can handle, and we've been very good at it. The bottom line is, it is our goal to be your protector when necessary, advisor, negotiator, and to successfully conclude the litigation for you in a way that is very favorable. Knowledge is power, and the folks who know what they're doing empower you. They enable you to make the right kind of decisions that best serves you. And that's our number one goal, frankly. Our number one ministry is to serve you. Welcome back to Legal Lines. I'm Locke Meredith. Again, we're speaking with Andrew Murrell. He is the spokesman for the City of St. George group, trying to create a new city in East Baton Rouge Parish. Let's dive back in. So let's assume that the register determines that you do in fact have 25% of the voting folks in the proposed boundary for the new city. What happens next? Uh, it would be moved at that point to the governor's office to certify the signatures. Uh, there's no process for that. I assume at that point he would, I would hope, would look at the job the registrar of voters did and say, yep, that's tw that's 25%, that's the right number, and it would then be moved to the ballot at that point. Okay, and the ballot would be set when and kind of describe that process? Subject to being set, I couldn't tell you exactly Who when. sets it? Uh, I believe the governor's office sets it. Okay. Um, we would be looking at, optimistically, I would hope for next November. Uh, but that's optimistic because there's a lot of factors that will go into it before then. Uh, does the city decide to sue us? Uh, something we'd have to worry about. How long did it take for uh, Central and Zachary and Baker to, to ultimately? Central took, took several years, ultimately. Uh, they went through a similar process that we did. Um, and then this parish at that point did sue them, in fact. Uh, and it took a couple of times before they finally got it okay. they incorporated. So it's a long-term process. It is. We're in, we're in it for the long haul. We're not going to stop. We're never going away. Uh, we've got a goal and we've got the support. And at this point, anything the city parish would be doing to deny the people in St. George the right to vote, uh, from annexation to litigation, would kind of feel like voter suppression. Agreed. All right, so let's talk about it goes to ballot, describe who has to vote and how many numbers you need and all that. Another change in the former process now. The only ones who can vote in an election to incorporate St. George are those in the proposed boundary of St. George. So 25% say those of us within this boundary get to decide, and so there's a vote. There'll and a vote. What, what, a majority? Just a majority, 50.1%. So if 10 people vote and six people say yes, you got it. City of St. George. And vice versa. That's right. The, uh, the voting process. That's, that's right. right. Well, and sadly, I mean, it's, you know, you hope participation is better. I just did a, you know, a show with Secretary of State. Uh, and you wish participation was higher, but, you know. Well, and look, I'll tell you now, I don't care how many people show up to the polls uh, for the St. George election, whether it's 5% voter turnout or 100%. The support is so overwhelming in the St. George area at this point that it's going to pass. That's why the city is so terrified of us. If we get on the ballot, we're going to pass. So the next step, let's assume two, three years down the road, there is finally the city of St. George. How's it going to be run? Well, it's a public-private partnership. We've looked at uh, benchmarking of other cities that have done something similar to what we have. Uh, we've looked at Central. Their business model is very similar. It's it's a public-private partnership. We've looked at Sandy Springs, Georgia. I remember talking about uh, that. Sandy Springs is, is really our, our example. They are a true public-private partnership. They've been around for about a decade. Uh, they never raised their budget the entire decade. And how's the success of their schools and, and other matters? Their schools are now some of the top rated in the state of Georgia. They're running at a surplus. They now bond out their own projects using the city budget because they've got such a surplus. You know, it's so interesting. You would hope that you guys are all the tip of the arrow that kind of changes and helps all of America streamline for the better of everybody. Well, this is not trying to harm people. Before we get to America, I just want to help out East Baton Rouge Parish. Right. If we can be successful, how is this going to hurt the parish? That's the other lies that we keep hearing, that for some reason, St. George is going, it, it, first, St. George is going to bankrupt Baton Rouge. 
I don't know how that's possible because we're paying our taxes for our services unless you're taking more of our money to use it for spending elsewhere. Which isn't right. Which is Baton Rouge's problem. And then the other lie is we don't have enough money to support ourselves as a city. And if that were truly the case, then why are you so worried about us leaving? You must have been subsidizing us all this time. We just want to show a better model of government for the entire parish. I think that's the key, and a it, better model of government. And what that does is that brings families back to East Baton Rouge Parish. And when they come back, they start spending money in East Baton Rouge Parish. And when the taxes and the spending by government go down, you and I have more money in our pocket we get to spend at our local businesses. That's right. And so it feeds each other. You can still, you can keep watching Juven Crossing and town and populations migrate or you can do something about it and bring people home. The average voting age in EBR Parish is over 55 years old. There's no young people left. EBR school board's own study shows they're gonna close five schools by 2025 because of declining enrollment. They people lost, are leaving. They lost 3,700 students in the last, from 2010 to 2015. We're not gonna be the problem. We're part of the solution and they can start competing with us and learn better government from us and hopefully we can have a whole parish that operates as efficiently as we do. So uh, my recall was very minimal personnel. Most of it is kind of contracted out. Explain that. Well, the Constitution, state Constitution provides we're mandated to have certain offices. We're required to have them whether we like them or not. Uh, we, for example, Chief of Police. We have no intention of maintaining a St. George Police Department. We get great police service from the EBR Sheriff's Office. Sid Gotro. Let's let Sid keep doing his job. And he's done a fantastic job. And let's give job. him some more money so he can do an even better job for St. George. And fire? Fire, we're already covered by the St. George Fire Department. Again, doing a great job. A phenomenal job, one of the best at they, what they do, and we've been paying for it. Those services are not going away. They're not diminishing. They're gonna be the same level they are or better. Um, at, at that point, you're just looking at privatizing public works, for example. Um, why do you have a guy on payroll that you gotta pay a pension to 20 years after he retires? That's kinda of not the way the world works anymore, I at least not in the private sector. What's, what's alarming is we've seen the examples already in California and Detroit and some of these other larger metro areas that have shown that this business model fails. Right. And it's not that those employees were bad employees, no. it's just the city was, it, improperly managed to the point there's no money to pay what those promises were. Of our 900 plus million dollar budget, about 150 million of that's dedicated to pension liability for employees that no longer work for us. Instead, you privatize those services so you get them competitive and you get them cheaper and they're subject to contracts, which means- Performance, they, competition. Exactly right. Yes. If you don't do your job, I will replace you, which is really hard to do in the city parish government model. And also it gives you a chance that when that employee retires, your obligation to that employee is done, it ceases. Let them have a 401k, let their employer take care of that problem. So we won't have legacy costs like the city has incurred now. So what would you expect to be kind of the, the state of affairs in the next uh, six months? Next six months, I, I pray that uh, we have some validated signatures in the next six months and that we have a ballot in our future. Unfortunately, I anticipate because the city refuses to change the way it does business because they don't care about taxpayer dollars and they don't care about making things better. Unfortunately, I'm afraid they're gonna to try to find another avenue to suppress voters, which is gonna be litigation. And I know Mayor Sharon Broom is a wonderful woman and she's trying to do the best she can, but this is, this is a, a situation that's gonna to have to be resolved, it sounds like, in the courts. It would be an embarrassing problem to have where EBR Parish is dedicating EBR Parish tax dollars, paid for a lot by the City of St. George residents to fight the City of St. George and fight its own people. And no, uh, no attempts to try and discuss this, mediate this, resolve it without all this? At this juncture, there's been no changes in three years. Andrew, thank you very much. Appreciate you giving us an update. Thanks for having this me. This is Locke Meredith with Legal Lines. My guest, Andrew Mural for the City of St. George. See you next time.